Okay, hello everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for this month's Black History Series presentation titled Dear Cousin M, Marianne Chad Carey and Genealogies of Resistance with Dr. Kristen Mariah. Dr. Mariah is an assistant professor at, of English at the at Queen's University. She holds a BAH English and Comparative Literature from Western University, an MA in English from McGill, an MPhil in English from the CU. Uh, NY Graduate Center and a PhD in English from the City University of New York. She is also one of the inaugural recipients of the Queen's University Black Scholars Excellence in Mentorship Awards, and her writing can be found in the American Quarterly, C Magazine, PAJ, a journal of performance and art, theater research in Canada, and Canadian Theater Review. She is also the editor of the first volume of scholarly essays about Marianne Shad Carey, which will be published by the University of Pennsylvania Press in 2024. Uh, before we begin, um, I just uh, ask that everyone uh, could please uh, keep your mic muted just so that it doesn't distract our speaker while she's talking. Uh, following her presentation, there will be a question and answer period. So just type in your questions in the comment section or you can raise your hand and I'll call on you. And at this point, you're more than welcome to turn on your camera and your microphone at that point. Uh, and just one final note, if you would like to support programming such as our Black History, you can go to the museum's website, amosburgfreedom.org to make a donation. Uh, now I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Mariah. Thank you so much for being with us here today. Okay, um, thank you so much for this invitation, Lorraine. This is really fantastic, and it's an honor to be invited to speak um, for the Amherstburg um, Society and also um, to talk about Marianne Chad Carey. And so um, without further ado, um, thank you actually to everybody who's joining us here today. So stated plainly, the facts of her life are as follows. Mary Ann Chad Carey was born in Wilmington, Delaware in 1823, at a time when owning Black Americans was still legal within the state and a driving force in its economy. Her parents, Abraham Doris Shad and Harriet Burton Parnell, were born free, but they did not take their freedom lightly. The Shads were conductors on the Underground Railroad and active members of the abolitionist movement. And their eldest daughter, Mary Ann, described her father, Abraham D. Shad, as the chief brakeman on the Delaware Underground Railroad. Education was a central value for the Shad family and they fought to ensure that each of their 13 children had the opportunity to attend school. The Shads left the state of Delaware when educating black children became illegal there, settling in Westchester, Pennsylvania. Abolitionist activism and the importance of education were lessons that the Shad children took to heart. And six years after leaving Delaware, at the age of 16, Marianne Shad would eventually become a teacher. She began writing and participating in Black political discourse at an early age. And she self-published her first pamphlet, Hints to the Colored People of the North, in 1849, when she was only 25 years old. Her determination to write and participate in literary discourse was intense. In that same year, her letters to Frederick Douglass were published in the North Star. And like her father before her, Mary Ann Shad Carey was an active participant in the Colored Convention movement, a rarity for Black women in the 19th century. As a young activist, she attended the first North American Convention of Colored Freemen held in Toronto at St. Lawrence Hall in 1851. Soon after, Mary Ann Shad Carey published a plea for immigration in 1852, a document with firm, which firmly established her support for the project of Black migration to Canada in the wake of the Fugitive Slave Act of 1850. Mary Ann Chad Carey eventually immigrated to Windsor, Ontario, where she founded the Provincial Freeman in 1853, becoming the first Black woman editor and publisher in North America. Through the Provincial Freeman, she fostered a critical forum for intellectual and political exchange across borders in Black communities. It remains one of the most important records of Black life in Canada and a testament to the broad spectrum of Black politics and print in North America. It also established Shad Carey as a counterpoint to canonical writers like Susanna Moody, a white Canadian settler, Roughing It in the Bush, Life in Canada, published in 1851, became emblematic of 19th century Canadian women's writing. As a progressive journalist, staunch abolitionist, and political activist, Mary Ann Chad Carey pushed the boundaries of expectations for women in the 19th century. Her husband, Thomas Carey, died only four years after their wedding in 1860. And according to her biographer, Jane Rhodes, the two lived apart more often than not. 
Eventually, she and her young children, Sarah and Linton, moved back to the United States. And Chad Carey began a new chapter there that included working as a recruitment officer for the Union Army. Marianne Chad Carey became the only Black woman from Canada that we know of to help recruit Black Union soldiers for the war effort. After the Civil War, upon graduation from, from Howard University, she went on to become one of the first Black women in the United States to earn a law degree. She was the first Black woman to vote in a national election in the United States. She led a life of many firsts. Since 1994, she has been officially recognized as a person of historical significance by the government of Canada. In 1998, she was inducted into the National Women's Hall of Fame in the United States. An overview of Shad Carey's legacy in life greets visitors as they enter the National Museum of African American History in Washington, D.C., one of her hometowns. Her house on W Street in nor Northwest in Washington, D.C. is a National Historic Landmark. And recently, Archives Ontario, the Archives Ontario Marianne Chad Carey Fonds, a cache of her correspondence, handwritten drafts, and other ephemera, has been accepted for entry into the Canada Memory of the World Register by the Canadian Commission for Union History. Marianne Chad Carey was a notable member of the Black female feminist intellectuals, the class of Black feminist intellectuals that we become known as. Brittany Cooper explains that race women explicitly fashioned for themselves a public duty to serve their people through diligent and careful intellectual work and attention to proving the intellectual character of the race. Though Cooper focuses on Black women intellectuals in the post-reconstruction United States, when we look at Mary Ann Chad Carey, we find strong evidence that the activist tradition of Black women intellectuals in North America has long roots. Chad Carey stands as an early model of how Black women could seize opportunities to shape public discourse while overcoming substantial barriers. As legal historian Martha Jones puts it, Chad Carey was part of the Black vanguard. And yet during her lifetime, she faced harsh public criticism and rejection for her monumental efforts. Describing her first pamphlet, Hints to the Colored People of the North, a correspondent for the North Star reported that very little money has been paid for it. And some readers said that had they known that the work contains some of the things which it does, they would not even have had it as a gift. Undaunted, Shad Carey insisted on the right to be heard in person as well as in print. She was one of only three women delegates to participate in the 1855 College Convention in Philadelphia, a victory which was won in the face of significant opposition to women speakers. As a result, she faced criticism and derision in some abolitionist newspapers. Critics took particular issue with her willingness to transgress gender boundaries. Some of that pushback resulted in outright omission from historic records. For example, speaking of the 1855 Colored Convention Minutes, Gabrielle Foreman notes that nowhere does a powerful emigration debate between her and fellow de delegate J.J. Bias that spilled over into the post-convention coverage appear. So while Mary Ann Chad Carey seems to have always occupied the outer limits of nationhood and gender, her positionality was both a blessing and a curse. She was not invested in the respectability politics that were so important to black political leaders during the period and she paid a price for it. In contemporary discourse, she is someone that theorist Fred Moten and Stefano Harney might describe as a subversive intellectual. Over the span of seven decades, Mary Ann Chad Carey took on many professional roles, including educator, abolitionist, editor, writer, cultural critic, and entrepreneur. Despite these stunning accomplishments, considerations of her legacy have often been subscribed, circumscribed by gender. W.E.B. Du Bois' description of Mary Ann Chad Carey is informative here, explaining that she was well-educated, vivacious, with determination shining from her sharp eyes, Du Bois also takes the time to write that Chad Carey was tall and slim of that ravishing dream-born beauty, that twilight of the races which we call mulatto. Here, Du Bois' patronizing description of Chad Carey's body and mind is significant because it points to the way that Chad Carey's prodigious cultural contributions were often minimized by the fact of her gender. And the implications of this kind of sexism have been profound. Her male colleagues and interlocutors, 
Men like Frederick Douglass, Martin Delaney, William Still, and Henry Bibb, to name a few, have long enjoyed significant critical attention. Even today, a cursory search of academic resources like the MLA International Bibliography reveal fewer than 20 scholarly works about Mary Ann Shad Carey. A similar search of the Arts and Humanities Citation Index reveals even fewer hits. The dearth of critical attention is especially unusual, given that during her lifetime, her outspokenness in writing and in public was frequently a subject of news and even gossip. And here, of course, I not only refer to early, occasionally glowing reports about her activism and publications like the North Star, but the harsh criticism she faced from foes like Henry Bibb, the publisher of The Voice of the Fugitive, who famously claimed that Miss Shad has said many things which we think will add nothing to her credit as a lady. In other words, Mary Ann Shad Carey was a polarizing yet notable, trailblazing 19th century Black feminist with radical politics who occupied multiple subject positions during her lifetime. She was adventurous, unpredictable, and prolific. She was always on the move. And in material like an evocative letter written to her brother at the beginning of her sojourn in Canada, we sense her breathless excitement for the controversial project of Canadian settlement for Black Americans seeking to escape chattel slavery. In that letter, now in the archives of Ontario, Mary Ann Chad Carey phones, she proclaims that in anything relating to her people, she is insensible of boundaries. And we get an inkling of the strength of her political motivations and her prose. And of course, what began as a short visit to a colored convention in Toronto ended up as a major intervention into Black life and politics here. A strident advocate for immigration to Canada and early adulthood, Chad Carey dove headfirst into Black Canadian political debates around heated issues like segregated schooling. Black political organizing tactics and white philanthropy um, when she moved north of the border. Even from a contemporary vantage point, her early life and activism can appear almost like a whirlwind. She can be hard to pin down. But Chad Carey's commitment to the plight of Black immigrants in Canada and her Canadian citizenship notwithstanding, some Canadian citizens still understand her as a U.S. phenomenon. Um, when I started working on Chad Carey, I was told by a local librarian, actually, that she was um, settler colonialism, um, 19th century immigration patterns in Canada notwithstanding, that Chad Carey was actually not really Canadian because she was born in America. Um, and that always struck me as a remarkable thing to say um, and even to consider given that she lived and operated in a context in which men like Sir John A. Macdonald, born in Scotland, um, in, in, in actually in a city in which men like Sir John A. Macdonald um, are still praised for their civic contributions. By contrast, in the United States, Chad Carey has become increasingly recognized for her stunning professional achievements and for her role in Black political organizing before, during, and after the U.S. Civil War. Last fall, I had the pleasure of visiting Wilmington, Delaware, a city with a vibrant Black history, and recognizing the parallels between their monuments to the Shad family, like the newly dedicated Mary Ann Chad Carey Post Office, and places like the Mary Shad Public School in Scarborough, Ontario, where I was born. These Black communities at the outskirts of power hold her dear and have long done so. There have been several recent attempts to fix Chad Carey in the wider public imagination and perhaps right past wrongs. In recent years, public works of art dedicated to Mary Ann Chad Carey have popped up in major cities in Canada and the United States. And the tributes have piled up rapidly as the 200th anniversary of her birth approached. On October 9th, 2020, Mary Ann Chad Carey was featured in a Google Doodle in honor of her 197th birthday. A mural of Chad Carey by Toronto artist Young Yemi covered the facade of Mackenzie House in downtown Toronto in fall 2021. The contemporary Google image search reveals even more fan art in her likeness. Significantly, in June 2018, she was the subject of an overlooked no more obituary in the New York Times. The column was meant to make amends for the paper's historic disinterest in the life stories of individuals who are not white men. And it provided a comprehensive overview of Mary Ann Chad Carey's life, but I argued that this column, along with others that have touted, recently touted new recognitions of Chad are ever so slightly misleading. 
So part of the work that I want to do here today is to affirm the fact that in black intellectual circles in the 19th century and beyond, Mary Ann Chad Carey was quickly recognized as a person worth watching. And we are gathered here today, thanks in large part to the work of black feminists. Her name frequently appears in catalogs of notable work by black women written by her contemporaries and black scholars in the early part of the 20th century. And in fact, Chad Carey was identified as a figure of interest by journalists reportings, reporting the goings on at colored conventions well beyond, um, well before the Civil War. And in fact, the title of this talk is a nod to an article written by William J. Wilson, also known as the Ethiope. A writer, writer, critic, and frequent contributor to the North Star, Wilson has also been credited as a contributing writer for the opening speech of the famed 1855 Colored Convention in Philadelphia. In a letter addressed to dear cousin M in his typical fashion, Wilson writes about some of the events at the 1855 Colored Convention and focuses on Chad Carey, quote, a daughter of Pennsylvania for speech and appearance. He explains that Ms. Shad is rather tall, but a fine physical organization, wholly feminine in appearance and demeanor, has a well-modeled head set upon a rather slender neck, which gives her, when erect or speaking animatedly, what white folks would say, a very saucy look. An anecdote of her will best illustrate this. In New York and coming down Broadway, at a time when colored women scarcely dared think of riding in the stages, Miss Shad threw up her head, gave one look, and a wave of her hand. There was such an air of impressive command in it that the huge, coarse, ruffinly, dri ruffinly driver, who had been known to refuse colored ladies, as though suddenly seized with paralysis, reined up to the curb, and she entered, and without hindrance, rode to the end of her journey. Miss Shad's eyes are small and penetrating and fairly flash when she is speaking. Her ideas seem to flow so fast that she at times hesitates for words, and yet she overcomes any apparent imperfection in her speaking by the earnestness of her manner and the quality of her thoughts. She is a superior woman, and it is useless to deny it, and however much we may differ with her on the subject of emigration. She obtained the floor and proceeded to and succeeded in making one of the most convincing and telling speeches in favor of Canadian emigration I have ever heard. It was one of the speeches of the convention. She at first had 10 minutes granted her as had the other members. At their expiration, 10 more were granted. And by this time came the hour of adjournment, but so interested was the house that it granted additional time to her to finish at the commencement of the afternoon session. And the house was crowded and breathless in its attention to her masterly exposition of our present condition in the advantages of Canada open to colored men of enterprise. Herein consisted the charm and potency of her speech. I particularly love this image of Shag Carey hailing a stagecoach in Manhattan because it speaks not only to her dynamism, but the obstacles she faces on a quotidian base, she faced on a quotidian basis as she pursued her activist yeah. agenda. And it's thanks to journalists like Wilson that we have a sense of what Chad Carey was like in person and how really formative she was. And it's notable that Frederick Douglass, with his reputation for supporting Black women's rights, actually publishes the kind of paper in which Chad Carey is praised for her forthrightness and political activism. And as we know, coverage of Chad Carey was certainly not uniformly positive. Us. Nevertheless, I argue that the Black community's interest and investment in Chad Carey, um, their sort of, even their ability to be piqued by her, actually never died. In Black communities in Canada and the United States, where many Shad family descendants still live, her memory is alive and well, thanks to the ongoing work of the Shad family and its extended members, starting early with her daughter and biographer, Sarah Elizabeth Carey Evans, and including contemporary independent historians like Adrian Shad and Irene Moore Davis. And our collective thinking about Shad Carey and her impact has been pushed in new directions thanks to these women. In December 2020, I had the pleasure of co-organizing a symposium about Chad Carey with my researcher, with my research partners at the Center for Black Digital Research. And at that event, I distinctly remember Shannon Prince talking about playing Marianne Chad Carey in a school play when she was a child. 
And I found that anecdote so incredible and it's actually stuck with me, given the important work that Shannon Prince does today to preserve black history in Buxton. It's a tiny moment, but it was so telling. In such black feminist artistic engagements with Chad Carey, black feminist pedagogies and curriculums that flourish in black communities here in Canada have been a recurring theme in these spaces. And it speaks to a method of being in the world that at once testifies to the importance of black women's work in cultural preservation. And so I'm sure that many of you know um, the history behind the Mary Ann Carey papers that are now held at Archives Ontario. A couple of weeks ago um, on October 14th at the From Grit to Glory event um, held by the City of Toronto, Archives Ontario and at various other community partners, I'm celebrating Mary Ann Chad Carey's 200th birthday. I was again struck um, this time by Maxine Robbins' story about her role in preserving the Chad Carey papers. And if you've seen Alison Margot Smith's short film, Mary Ann Chad Revisited, Echoes from an Old House, you might be familiar with some of the story too. The Robinses are Shad family descendants who purchased land once owned by Shad Carey's sister. There was an old building on that land and only after it was torn down did they realize that the attic of that building contained um, what is truly a treasure trove of papers connected to Shad Carey. Um, and people who have um, much more knowledge about the sort of um, vast resources of Canadian archival holdings have also really identified this as probably being um, the most comprehensive source that we have found to date um, around Black women's lives in Canada in the 19th century. And when we listen to Maxine Robbins describe her discovery of those papers in the rubble of the old building, we realize that one of the things that actually motivated her was an artistic and creative impulse. She was looking for old pieces of wood to make a triptych. And that's a powerful, concrete example of the way Black feminist art and creativity has actually fueled the preservation and promotion of Black feminist histories. And I just think that there's something so poetic there. Maxine Robbins was already looking for something in the remains of the Shad family's history, already convinced that something of beauty could be found there in the remnants of that old building. And it's truly incredible. I don't know that Maxine Robbins would call it that, but I consider it to be a form of Black feminist world making in action. And while in Canada, Black feminist artists, scholars, and educators have been central to the, sur to the resurgence of Mary Ann Chad Carey in public discourse, I would argue that we've really only begun to skim the surface of what this kind of connective tissue means for the preservation of Black feminist history in Canada. This is a place where, um, in my mind, we can benefit from thinking comparatively about Canada and the US in productive ways, much like Chad Carey. These acts of preservation, creation, and donation tie Black feminist history, literature, and art in Canada to a larger Black diasporic tradition of Black feminist archival practices. Lately in my teaching, I've been struck by the pivotal role of Ober Tanner, an enslaved Black woman who was friends with 18th century Black feminist poet Phyllis Wheatley in the preservation of Phyllis Wheatley's letters. Tanner is also a formidable figure in the preservation of Black feminist history and literature. Ober Tanner and Phyllis Wheatley's Ober Tanner and Phyllis Wheatley corresponded frequently. And in fact, as far as we know, Ober Tanner was the only Black person to keep up a regular correspondence with Phyllis Wheatley. Tanner claimed that their friendship extended to the ship on which they had both been transported to America. In 1809, Tanner, also a formidable figure, helped found the African Female Benevolent Society, a mutual aid society dedicated to literacy education of Black people. Nearly 30 years after Ober Tanner's death in 1863, Mrs. William Beecher, a member of the abolitionist family, whose more famous members included Henry Ward Beecher and Harriet Beecher Stowe, donated letters between Phyllis Wheatley and her enslaved friend Ober Tanner to the Massachusetts Historical Society. The letters have been given to Beecher by Tanner, preserved in what I imagine is an act of friendship, love, and hope. I like to imagine that Tanner waited until the right moment presented itself. She waited until they had both gained their freedom, until her grief at the loss of her friend had subsided, until a suitable intermediary between herself and a potentially hostile 19th century institution like the Massachusetts Historical Society could be found. She waited until she was, according to Beecher, a very little, very old, very infirm, 
very, very black woman with a great shock of the whitest wool all over her head. An uncommonly pious, sensible, and intelligent woman respected and visited by every person in Newport who could appreciate excellence. Tanner's faith in the importance of her friendship with Wheatley and their correspondence has had an impact on a generation of scholars and writers. Her patience and vision has the power to shift worldviews. The act of preserving those letters several decades prior to emancipation, even as a young Marianne Chad Carey was beginning to make her way in the world, meant that we have material evidence of the importance of Black feminism to early African-Americans, specifically to Phyllis Wheatley, the first Black woman in North America to publish poetry. Today, we can read Wheatley's work in relation to her correspondence with Tanner and understand the world in new ways. And I've been thinking a lot about that kind of miracle of preservation alongside the Mary Ann Chad Carey papers that were discovered by Maxine Robbins and the fact of their recent donation to Archives Ontario. For me, it's a powerful example of Black feminist archival practices in Canada and sets the bar high for further theorization and practice when it comes to Black history in Canada. I know that much has been written on archival principles and the centrality of records creation to archival practices and process. But again, I believe that we have yet to fully reckon with what it might mean for Black history in a Canadian context, particularly when it comes to Black feminist icons like Mary Ann Chad Carey, or the means by which we can identify and preserve the records of Shad Carey's to come. The Black feminist archival impulse I'm describing here is a form of resistance. Recently, scholar Holly A. Smith has argued that predominantly white institutional archives have not prioritized documenting Black women and other historically marginalized groups for various reasons, from benign neglect to intentional erasure. Smith affirms that typically materials by or about Black women were subsumed in the papers of others, slave owners, businesses, or husbands, or families. Throughout the 19th and 20th century, Black women scholars, writers, and activists led the charge for exploring Black women's contributions to history, including actively preserving Black records and publications. And yet Smith notes that increasingly more repositories are acquiring collections related to Black culture and history. Archives are engaging with collaborative projects uplifting Black women and communities. When I read this, I really think about women like Archiv an archivist like Melissa Nelson here in Ontario, and I look towards a future that is marked by her Black feminist methodologies. The creation and preservation of Black feminist archives here is a form of resistance against white supremacy that stands to serve future generations. Just to start to wrap up, I'd say that we owe so much to Black women like Mary Ann Chad Carey in the here and now. To be sure, a return to Shad Carey began in the 1970s with the republication of the 1926 biographical sketch written by Sarah Carey Evans, her daughter. The 1970s marked a pivotal moment in the study of Black women's intellectual history. Again, recently, scholar Sarah Ellen Strongman had noted the significance of that era and has termed the discovery and reclamation of Black women writers from the past that took place during the 70s as the archaeological impulse. In the case of Mary Ann Chad Carey, that impulse has had deep implications. Jane Rhodes has noted that few 19th century African-American women produced a written record that has survived the passage of time. The lack of documentary sources has been a key obstacle in the writing of Black women's intellectual history. But this too is changing. With the help of my colleagues at the Center for Black Digital Research, I have fostered conversations with Archives Ontario about the permanent acquisition of the Mary Ann Chad Carey Fonds. And at the Center for Black Digital Research, the work of Shirley Moody Turner and her team to create an online paper locator for Black women organizers, the Black Women Organizers Archives, also promises to shift the field. The BWOA directs researchers to all known repositories for 19th century Black women organizers like Mary Ann Chad Carey. And changes like these will lay the groundwork for much needed future research in this field. As it stands, Jane Rhodes, Mary Ann Chad Carey, The Black Press in the 19th Century remains the most comprehensive single authored work about Mary Ann Chad Carey nearly 25 years after its publication. Rhodes scholarship situates Mary Ann Chad Carey in a long line of black women journalists that includes the legendary Ida B. Wells. But Rhodes biography also reminds us that Mary Ann Chad Carey is the foremother of many contemporary black women journalists. 
Similarly, the Black Press and Protest stands alongside, um, or the Black Press and Protest stands alongside Carla Peterson's Doers of the World, African American women speakers, and writers in the North as one of the most important scholarly sources about Chad Carey. In Doers of the World, Carla Peterson traces an interdisciplinary approach to the study of early Black feminists. Peterson argues that Black women like Mary and Chad Carey were so estranged from the nation that the interrelated questions of how to address mainstream North American society and how to make themselves at home there form the very basis of their writing. This nuanced analysis of the rhetorical moves made by Chad Carey and her contemporaries encourages close readings of a range of their writing and has informed generations of Black scholars. Um, and I would be remiss if I didn't mention Nika Denny's um, newly published, just newly released, you should get yourself a copy of um, the selected critical writings of Shaq Carey. Today, as we recognize the 200th anniversary of Mary Ann Chad Carey's birth, we are again in the midst of a watershed moment. Her cultural and historic importance feels like an open secret. In some circles, it almost goes without saying that Mary Ann Chad Carey is one of the most significant black feminists in North America, it's a paradox that scholars have grappled with over decades. I agree that despite a resurgence of interest in 19th century black life and culture, it seems as if, it feels as if, Mary Ann Chad Carey has never quite been given her due in terms of recognition as an important figure in the 19th century, um, in terms of organizing, black organizing, black arts and black letters. Um, I've argued in other places that Mary Ann Chad Carey is actually one of the first women to theorize black performance um, and is thus the black, first black um, performance theory um, specialist that we have. We have so much to learn from her records and writing. What happens when we rectify, when we rectify the tendency to ignore the ways she has been remembered and center Mary Ann Chad Carey's voice in debates about black citizenship and belonging? What impact can she have on our understanding of black political organizing, black print culture and public life in the 19th century? And what does her varied and long-standing engagement in public sphere in the public sphere tell us about gender politics and place? These are questions that continue to be worth answering when it comes to Mary Ann Chad Carey. And I argue alongside um, actually many other people in this room that she provides a model for thinking about black feminist intellectual life and black life across the, across the black diaspora that has rarely been paralleled. In fact, her impact on black feminist intellectual profound and I hope will continue to reverberate if we are lucky for another 200 years. Thank you. Thank you, Thank so, you much so much for that, for that excellent, excellent presentation. presentation. Um, we're going um, to start, start through the Q&A &A now. now. If, you if you wanted to wanted turn, to your, turn camera your camera on, you're welcome, you're welcome to do so. To do so. Uh, if not, uh, if that's, not okay that's okay, too. Um, so uh, if so anyone has, has any questions, any questions you can, you can either, either put, them put them in the, in the comment, comment section, section or raise your hand and I'll call on you. Call on you. Um, but um, I guess but I'll, start. I'll start. Um, I apologize, um, I apologize for, the for the echo, echo. Um, but, um, but I was just I was wondering, just wondering, you talked you about Mary Ann Shad Carey's connection to, to the Toronto, Toronto Convention. convention. Mm -hmm. um, I was wondering, um, I was wondering if you've heard, heard any, 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 any evidence, evidence? evidence? of her participation, her participation in other, in other conferences, conferences in Ontario. In Ontario. I know there I know was there some was that some happened that in Amherstburg, Amherstburg Sandwich, which, and, and also, also uh, London. Uh, London. Have you heard any evidence of that? Um, I know that she played a big role in the, um, the organization and the meetings that happened around raising funds for John Brown. Um, and so oh, wow. she, I think, is actually one of the key organizers of those meetings um, when John Brown traveled to Chatham in order to oh, wow. raise funds and raise support um, for his insurrection. Mary Ann Chad Carey actually plays a key role in that meeting um, as a follow up ends up being the editor of the only um, firsthand account by a black participant in that uprising to survive. So she actually um, edits a memoir by um, one of the Canadians who goes um, south to participate um, in John Brown's insurrection. Wow. wow. Thank you. Thank you. I, I had no had idea she had her involvement, involvement in Chatham, in Chatham for that, for that, that, yeah, conference, that conference or convention. Or convention. Um, I was um, also, I was also wondering, wondering if you could, if you talk, could a talk a little, little bit about, about uh, in your bio, in your bio that I read, I read, it talks it about talks the about release, the release of, a book, of a book of articles about Mary Ann Chad Carey in 2024. If you could talk, you a, little talk a little bit about that. about that. 
Yeah, happy to help. Um, and in fact, um, two of the contributors are actually in the room. Um, so I was very fortunate amazing, to amazing. Um, be able to um, inveigle Ronaldo Walcott to revisit his foundational essay about Mary Ann Chad Carey and actually think about what she means now in terms of all of the excitement and new artistic productions around Mary Ann Chad Carey that have been released. Um, Jiwon Wu is also in the room um, and she has a really fantastic um, chapter about Mary Ann Ted Carey's relationship with Mary Bibb um, and how the two sort of maybe overlapped, didn't overlap, um, sort of the potential ways that our thinking about um, 19th century Black feminist life can change when we think about those two women's work together. Um, but it will be the first edited collection of scholarly essays about Mary Ann Ted Carey that's published. Um, which is exciting in many ways. Um, I think about it alongside work like Nika Denny's um, recent released, recently released um, anthology of Mary Ann Ted Carey's writing, um, because I think that those two things uh, will potentially actually shift how we understand both Mary Ann Ted Carey um, and Black woman's life in the 19th century. Um, and so in some ways, you know, I'm happy that we were able to gather all these people together and to get them to think about Mary and Carey in new ways. But I'm even more excited to see what happens like five years down the line, right, as sort of this new research that is hopefully stimulated by this new work um, begins to bubble up. Amazing. Amazing. And, and I'm, I'm very excited, very excited for, for Anika Denny's, Denny's book, book to arrive, to arrive on, on my doorstep. doorstep. I am I so excited, so excited to, read that. to read that. And, and um, I'm, I'm not sure if sure you mentioned, mentioned is, there, is a there a release date, date for, for your, your, the, the, the uh, collection, um, collection of articles? Of articles? Um, there's no release date yet. It's in press. Um, and okay, so it okay. will be it will be released um, in 2024 by the University of Pennsylvania Press. But I don't have a, a firm date yet. But it's okay, it's, okay. it's underway. I, I, completely I completely understand. understand. And, and please, please feel, free feel free to email me when, when it is, because, because I would love, I would to, love promote to promote that book, that book like, crazy. like crazy. I'm so excited for that. Yeah, happily, happily. It's been a it's been a long time coming and a labor of love. Um, we started thinking about um, gathering people together for the symposium that we held in 2020, um, like way back in like 2018, 2019. Um, and all of the contributors worked so hard on this um, collection, you know, during the midst of the pandemic and just really stuck with it. Um, and I'm just really proud. I'm proud that it happened. And, and I'm, very, I'm excited very excited that it's that happening. happening. So thank so you so thank much you so for, much your, for work your work and, and everyone, everyone who uh, participated, participated in putting, in the, book putting the book together and writing, and writing the articles. articles. Um, I'm, I'm extremely, extremely excited, about, excited that. about that. Thanks so much, Lauren. Um, is there, um, is anyone, there anyone who has a comment has or, a comment um, or um, something that they wanted to ask? You're welcome to raise your hand. Okay, okay. Uh, it doesn't uh, it seem like we have, any, we other have any other questions, questions or comments. Or comments. Uh, so uh, so um, I guess we I will. Guess we will oh, actually, we have, actually a we have a comment, comment from, from Ann Harrison. Harrison. If you, you want to unmute yourself, yourself you're, welcome you're welcome to. to. Oh, and, oh, and you can, you can uh, unmute. Uh, unmute. I can't I hear you. Hear you. Uh, perhaps, uh, perhaps you want, you to, want to write your, write comment, your comment in the, in the comment, section? comment section. Okay, okay. Well, well, I'm sure, I'm sure that, that um, we can we reach can out to Dr. Dr. Mariah if you, if you have um, a, question. a question. If you want to reach out to us afterwards, afterwards we, can we can get that get comment, that comment to, her to her afterwards. afterwards. Um, but, um, but now, for now uh, I guess we'll uh, leave, it leave it at that. At that. And, and uh, uh, if, you, if wanted you wanted to leave, leave with any, with any uh, final, uh, final words, Dr. Mariah, Mariah you're, you're welcome, welcome to. to. Uh, or, or I can just can end just it now. End it now. <laughs> <laughs> um, I just thank you again so much for inviting me here today. Um, it's really been a pleasure to um, think through some of these recent developments and celebrations around Mary Ann Chad Carey, um, to really uplift the fact that her work is now being held at Archives Ontario. And that's a resource that is open to the public. Everybody can go and interact with those papers and really um, sort of sit with what it meant for her to be a correspondent, to be a family member, to be a community member. Um, you know, for me, that's really, really exciting. And I know that those kinds of things are going to shift how we think about Black history in Canada in really profound ways. And so um, it's been a pleasure to sort of think through that and talk about that with you today. Excellent. Excellent. Thank, Thank you again, you again so, much. so much. Uh, and we have, uh, and people, we have people in the comment, in the comment section, section um, just, um, just writing, writing thank, thank you so, so much, much for your presentation. For your presentation. 
You're very welcome. Yeah, thanks for showing up, Jiwan. You do so much. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, and, oh, we're, and seeing we're seeing more, more thank, you thank you comments. comments. Uh, many, uh, many, many thank you comments in the comment, comment section. section. Thank you, Excellent. everybody. So thank, so you, everyone, thank you, everyone, so much, so much, for, much joining for joining us today. Joining us today. And, and uh, thank you again, thank you again Dr. Dr. Moraya, Moraya, so much, so much for, giving for giving such a fantastic, such a fantastic presentation. presentation. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Rachel. Thank you, everybody, for showing up today. It was really lovely.